Welcome to Clyde Belt Conversations by Clyde Belt International. Today's guest is former Secretary of State and Treasury and White House Chief of Staff James Baker. We spoke with Secretary Baker in his Houston office on a range of issues, including his views on leadership and leadership qualities. Clyde Build appreciates the support of the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. So, Secretary Baker, thank you so much for taking time uh, with me this morning, and we do appreciate it. It's really an honor to speak with you. Thank you, sir. And I think I am here, as are the listeners here, to really learn from you and in, in your leadership and how you have, throughout your career and your personal life, been a, a unifier, a, co- a coalition builder, someone who has been really a um, a gentleman in terms of engaging with other people and listening and so um, thank you for taking time. I'm delighted to be with you. I'd like to start with we are here in Houston uh, looking over the beautiful city this morning and start with you being born in 1930 here in Houston and describe a little bit what it was like to grow up in Houston in the 1930s. Well, he, uh, of course, that was during the during the Great Depression. <clears throat> Although I didn't didn't see any of that or note any of that. First of all, I would have been too young, of course. But but even after I became uh, five, six, seven years old, uh, I never saw any of that uh, in the city of Houston. The city has has uh, prospered tremendously. Uh, my <clears throat> my mother came to Houston. Uh, when there were in 1902, when there were only 35,000 people here, mm, wow. my father uh, was born here. My forebears came to Houston from Huntsville, Texas. Well, really, originally from Alabama by way of Huntsville, Texas. My great grandfather, Judge James A. Baker, was a was a uh, uh, judge uh, on a district court that included Grimes County, which at that time uh, embraced a large part of Harris County, the county where Houston is. Uh, When the South lost the Civil War, my my great-grandfather was kicked off the bench because he was Mm. a Confederate judge. Interesting. And uh, he started practicing law in Huntsville, Texas. Uh, and ultimately migrated to Houston in, 19, uh, in 1872 and became a uh, senior partner in this law firm. Uh, this law firm, now known as Baker Botts, uh, we think is the longest uh, continuously operated business in the state of Texas. Mm. We, we trace our origin back to 1840. Amazing. When, uh, Texas wasn't even a state, it was an independent country, mm-hmm. and we're still the same, uh, same law firm uh, uh, doing legal work in the state of Texas. So the Baker uh, in the Baker Botts is your the grandfather? The Baker in Baker Botts was my great-grandfather. Great-grandfather. Yes, I'm the fifth Baker Baker who's been here. Mm. My great-grandfather uh, came, then my grandfather a man known as Captain Baker built this firm and did a lot to make this firm what it is today. Mm-hmm. And then my dad was a partner here, and then my son joined the firm in Washington. My son, uh, James A. Baker IV, who had uh, worked for Howard Baker when he was Senate Majority Leader. He was an assistant majority leader counsel in, to, uh, to Senator Howard Baker. Yes. I wasn't in the firm. Yes. at that time because there was a nepotism rule. Yeah, I see. So when I got out of law school, uh, I joined another very fine Houston firm called Andrews, Kurth, Campbell, and Jones, and I practiced there for 22 years. I see. It was only after I left government in 1993 that I became uh, associated with Baker Botts. I've been here now 25 years. Fascinating. So I've practiced law in Houston for 47 years. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, was, it was a wonderful town to grow up in. Um, it was uh, thriving. My family were 
uh, in the upper echelons of, of business and social uh, life here in Houston. Uh, my my uh, great grandfather, my grandfather, my father were all men of uh, great capacity but great character and integrity mm -hmm. and each and every one of them uh, set a standard which was constantly <laughs> called to my attention as I was growing up. My mom and mom, mom particularly, sometimes my dad too, said, now you know son, you've got quite a legacy to live up to <laughs> and you've got to do this and you've got to do that and make good grades and work hard. Yes. And, Yes. And so I, w and I had a wonderful upbringing. Yes. It was sort of a bucolic life uh, growing up here in Houston. I had a wonderful mom and a wonderful dad. And, uh, and so I was uh, very fortunate. And that has been, I have found, a thread throughout your career, that personal connection to family, uh, even now with your, your wonderful family and your grandkids. It's just been a thread throughout your career. and. Uh, I've been very fortunate. <coughs> I, I, I've had two be wonderfully uh, beautiful and, and uh, super wives. Uh, the mm -hmm. first one uh, died too soon. She was only 38 years of age when she died of breast cancer, leaving me with four small uh, boys. Uh, three and a half years later, I married my current wife, uh, Susan. We've been married now for 45 years. <laughs> She and we have 18 down. grandchildren. We have oh. eight children and 18 grandchildren. Remarkable. Well, she had three. She was a widow, and I was a, a widower. I had four kids, and she had three kids. Yeah. And we put that family together. She did all the work of, of, of putting it together and making it work. And then we had one of our own. Yes. And uh, she's a daughter, uh, a daughter Mary yeah. Bonner. And so we're like the Brady Bunch, his, <laughs> his, hers, and theirs. Yeah, that's an amazing, amazing story. And she herself has done so much for Houston. And well, she has uh, indeed. Yeah. And, and she's, uh, she's very active uh, in the church. Mm -hmm. She's uh, written a book that uh, has gotten quite uh, a bit of circulation. And she's called upon quite often to speak uh, on, uh, on spiritual matters. And she's very well respected still at the State Department in terms of what she contributed. The, the, well, good. the yeah. spouse of uh, Secretary often makes we, a contribution. We, you know, we started, uh, we started an association of, uh, of Foreign Service Wives. Yes, uh, AFSW. A yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and we contribute to that every yes. year and it's yes. still, still functioning. Yes, so you were then 11 years old when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Right. And do you have any memories of that? I have that vivid memories mm -hmm. of everything about the Second World War. I was 11 years old. I was, uh, I was, uh, I became a good tennis player in my youth. I spent a lot of time out at the River Oaks Country Club playing tennis, learning tennis. And one Sunday afternoon, I'm out there playing tennis and I walk by the caddy shack. Uh, in those days, they had a, uh, the, the members' clubs were kept in a storage place, and that's where the caddies congregated before they were picked at, to, 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 to mm -hmm. determine whose bag mm -hmm. they were going to carry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the radio was blaring, and I heard this, this announcement that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And, and I remember it very vividly. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, of course, I was a, a teenager, and I was just, just barely too young to fight in, uh, in World War II. My war was the Korean War. Fortunately, mm -hmm. I didn't have to fight. But uh, I remember a lot about World War II, and I read a lot about it. I was, I was a voracious reader at yes. the time. And, uh, and I've read uh, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich and Mein mm -hmm. Kampf and things like that. I, so that I, was a very formative period, just growing yeah. up here uh, in the 30s, and then that moment, right. Right. and then being so engaged and reading about it really inform uh, the direction and then you you from here you went to Pennsylvania you went to the, the Hill oh, School. I, well I left I was in, in high school here in Houston and after the 10th grade I my father had gone to the Hill School in Pottstown Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and uh, I went to the Hill School uh, for two years 11th and 12th grade mm -hmm. 
and uh, I went from there to Princeton University where I graduated in 1952 uh, and then spent uh, two years on active duty in the United States Marine Corps mm -hmm. and then went to law school at the University of Texas. Right. And when you were at Princeton, even when you were at the Hill School and at Princeton, do you remember any individuals who were very influential in your life uh, or as a student back then, any professors or individuals that really influenced your thinking about the world? Well, uh, I certainly do at Princeton. Um, I really didn't want to go off to prep school when I went to the Hill School and when my parents dropped me off uh, I didn't know a, a soul, and I, I was really a little bit scared and felt, uh, felt almost abandoned, but I really enjoyed the Hill School. Mm -hmm. I, I, I formed some lasting friendships. In fact, uh, my, my roommates at Princeton were three fellows that were mm -hmm. in my class at the Hill School. Interesting. I was the only uh, two-year boy, as they call it, at the Hill School who who was elected to the student government committee at the Hill School. And, uh, and so I really enjoyed it. Uh, at Princeton, I was so uh, overwhelmed by the freedom that I experienced there when I was a freshman compared to the way it was in prep school. In those days, prep school, we did, we, there were no women and no girls. You could, we had one weekend in senior year that you could invite a date down for a dance. That was <laughs> it. And so when I got to Princeton and had the freedom to go into New York uh, and, and have fun, I did it and I almost flunked out. I mean, I really didn't pay much attention to my to my studies because the newfound freedom was was too much. Yes, yes. But I do remember uh, I, I remember a lot about my teachers at yes, Princeton. Yes. I had um, I wrote a thesis for a man named Professor Walter Hall, Walter Buzzer Hall. Uh, I, my dad had written his thesis for Buzzer Hall. Dad was in the class of 1915 at Princeton. I was in the class of 48. I was the last uh, person that, that uh, Professor Hall, uh, uh, whose thesis Professor Hall supervised, and then he retired. But I also remember other, uh, other outstanding professors, one of whom was a man named Cyril Black, uh, who taught me Russian history. Hmm. Uh, I had a, a a, a wonderful, almost second father here in, in Houston uh, growing up, the tennis professional at the River Oak Country Club, was a man named Andrew Jitkoff, and he was a white Russian who'd been, uh, who'd had to flee Russia when the Bolsheviks took over. And uh, he taught me a lot, he taught me my tennis, but he also taught me uh, a lot about life. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I took this Russian history course with Cyril Black. So I'd had this connection with Russia, and little did I know mm. that I would be the Secretary of State of the United mm. States when the Soviet, when communism collapsed, the wall came down and the Soviet Union imploded, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and would be dealing with so many uh, Russian leaders from mm. uh, Gorbachev and Severnadze and Yeltsin and Putin and others. Was so, this individual, Andrew, your tennis coach, was he still alive to witness that, to see? No, how you, no, yeah. he was not alive. He was not alive, I don't think. I don't believe he was. I, I would have to check that. Mm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, John, can you can check that? He, I don't remember when Andrew died. Uh, his son, uh, I was godfather to his son. And then his son made me his son's godfather, ah. and so I'm. And I just went to that that, that godson of mine's uh, wedding down to he's he's now a king ranch heir, king yes. big king yes. ranch in Texas. Yes. Uh, Andrew Jikoff's son Andrew Jr. married a king ranch ah. heir in wow. Paris, and uh, and their child is named Nicholas. And nice, he, nice. He's my godson. When you were at Princeton, do you remember George Marshall or do you remember any uh, 
when the Marshall Plan coming out later in '49, but was, was that something you were following? Uh, as you uh, well, I knew about the Marshall Plan. I uh, gave a speech in uh, in nineteen. Uh, 89 or 90 or somewhere in that time frame in, in Alexander Hall at Princeton uh, talking about how the United States should relate to Russia as it became the successor to the Soviet Union. Uh, I don't recall much else about, I remember George Kennan was at that speech. Yes, yes. He was there, and I received the Kennan Award mm -hmm. at some point during my mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm. I can't remember mm -hmm. when. Uh, I don't remember Marshall meeting. I don't think I ever met George Marshall. Um, just shifting to leadership a, a bit here, you once said that, quote, you talk to your enemies, not just your friends. What did you mean by that? Well, we have a... <coughs> A lot of people believe that you, <clears throat> that the United States, as the preeminent power in the world, gives away something when it sits down to negotiate with another country that might want to might want to have uh, have a diplomatic exchange. But if that country is doing things we don't like it to do, there's an argument that says you don't you don't talk to them. Well. Uh, I understand that principle. I think there's some validity to it. But on balance, I think, generally speaking, it's better to, uh, to talk to people because <laughs> you don't need to talk to your friends, generally, unless you're mm -hmm. building a coalition, of course. Mm -hmm. But you do need to talk to your enemies. I always admired during the period of 90 to 91, you visited Syria, I think, 15 times. Yeah, that's like correct. That. And it really led to that engagement, the implicit recognition of Syria, of Riz Israel, which For is Israel. what Israel wanted. Well, it led to the Madrid Peace Conference, and the Madrid Peace Conference was quite, uh, quite an accomplishment at its time because uh, for the first time ever, Israel and all of her Arab neighbors sat down together to talk peace. And that constituted a recognition by those countries, those Arab countries, mm -hmm. of Israel's right to exist, mm -hmm. which they hadn't been mm -hmm. willing to do before. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, uh, that was an important achievement. It wasn't easy to do, but the key to getting it done was when uh, Hafez al-Assad, the president of Syria, changed roughly 40 years of policy and said, okay, I've made a strategic uh, uh, calculation for peace. I'm going to go to the Madrid conference. I'm going to do this. Uh, if he hadn't done that, there would have been no Madrid conference. Mm -hmm. uh, Israel, uh, Israel had to go at that point. They were not particularly eager to go mm -hmm. under, under mm -hmm. a really hard line Israeli government led by uh, Prime Minister Itzhak Shamir, with whom, by the way, I had significant policy differences, but with whom I had a wonderful personal relationship mm -hmm. of trust and mm -hmm. confidence. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. and me, and me and him. So if we could talk a little bit about people who you knew really well, and I think Gerald Ford being one that you oh, knew yeah, him so well, a, and yeah. uh, perhaps uh, an underappreciated figure in United States history in some respects. You once said of him that, quote, he was simply a beautiful human being. He may have lacked glibness, but he had much, much more. He had character. What was the character of President Ford and what made him an effective leader? Well, I don't know the, uh, that I can answer that except to say that he was a man of, uh, of tremendous character and integrity. Um, he, he was the only unelected president we've ever had. He was the right man for the country at that time in the, in the immediate aftermath of Watergate. He had the good, he had the courage and conviction and good sense 
to pardon Richard Nixon, he knew that it would cost him in the election, but he knew it was the right thing to do. If America was not going to become uh, like a banana republic yes. where we where we put our prior former leaders in jail, mm -hmm. we, we should never, of course, ever get to that point. And, and that's the reason that, uh, I mean, F Ford w w had great courage and great strength and, um, and he almost pulled it off. I was his campaign chairman in that election in 76 and we came from 25 points behind to dead even on election day. Barely lost mm. by 10,000 votes out of 81 million votes who were cast. You turn 10,000 votes around in Iowa and Hawaii and Ford is elected and Carter would never have been president. Yes. And, and he took the defeat. Any, any, I, I've, I've been with presidents when they've lost. I've been with President Bush when he lost, 41. I've been with President Ford when he lost. It's hard, it's difficult. But he took it with great courage and and I think he's going to be uh, well regarded by history uh, for the role he played to heal the nation and to bring the nation back from the dark days of Watergate. Mm -hmm. You described the chief of staff job in Washington obviously as an <laughs> honor to serve, um, you've said that, but also one of the most difficult jobs in Washington. Now you're being very kind. I, I, de I describe it as the worst effing job in Washington. <laughs> so <laughs> it is. It's a very important job. You're you're probably the second most important person in the town, mm -hmm. but your staff, and you you better damn well remember that the, your staff. The job the job title is chief of staff, and when you get one who. Uh, likes the chief part of the title better than the staff part of the title, uh, he's going to fail. Mm. And it happens over and over and over because it, all of that power that you have is vicarious from the president. And the minute you forget that, nobody elected you, and the minute you forget that, you're in trouble. Mm. And that, that's what's happened to a, a number of chiefs of staff. They've, you don't want, uh, as your chief of staff, someone who's been a principal. Mm. Mm -hmm. So as a leader and a, an effective manager of people, when someone finds themselves in a difficult job, they're in a leadership position, it may not be the chief of staff mm -hmm. at the White House, but there are multiple examples of people in difficult jobs where they have to manage people and staff. Yeah. What are the important attributes for a leader and a manager in those situations? How do they approach that type of job? Um, what's your, your thought, your counsel, just having an experience being the chief of staff and in a difficult job? Well, uh, you, mean, you mean what are the uh, characteristics, what are the personal yeah. qualities that, yeah. well mm -hmm. you need, you, you need uh, determination, you need to be broad gauged enough to, uh, to consider all options, you need to, to uh, be committed to the course that you choose to take. You know, uh, I think it was James McGregor Burns who defined leadership as a commitment to values and the perseverance to fight for those values. I, I, I speak sometimes about leadership and I say I would, I would define it pretty much the same way, but I would use, use different words. I would say leadership in my view is knowing what to do and then doing it. The doing it part is what's hard. Mm -hmm. That's where so many people who might become leaders, who might have, might have become leaders, fail. Mm -hmm. But it's implementation. Mm -hmm. Implementation is so important. That's one of the things we today that I think is so regrettable uh, about where we are. Uh, the, the business and work of the people does not seem to, to get done in Washington mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, you know there are many reasons for that political dysfunction, but but one of them surely has to be that <laughs> that our leaders are not focused on the importance of implementation. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to stand up and articulate a great vision. You got to put that vision in. So that's why I'm a realist. That's why I'm a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. I mean, my view is. You, you, you acquire political power by, by winning elections. That, get, that gives you the right to, to put your political philosophy into policy, convert it into policy. But, but the only way you're going to be able to do that is to make sure you can implement. Mm -hmm. Close the deal. Mm -hmm. Make it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And President Reagan was known for that. It, it, it Absolutely. Just, uh, and all uh, Absolutely. people will have differences of opinion on policy, and yet as an implementer, certainly that. Yeah. Absolutely. Was. So for Ronald Reagan, obviously, like President Ford, you knew him very well and knew him mm -hmm. up close. What was he as Well, Ronald Reagan uh, had, uh, Ronald Reagan <coughs> held uh, a few very, very important principles or uh, philosophies uh, very very viscerally he held them. they were deep they were they were in his DNA mm -hmm. small government mm -hmm. lower taxes strong defense freedom of the individual these were encoded into his DNA and he knew what he believed he knew what he he believed in and uh, he didn't he know he was he never wavered from that he didn't care about the details of running the White House. He didn't care who played on the White House tennis courts or anything <laughs> like that. Yes. But he held these, uh, these big, big ideas mm -hmm. and he held very deeply. Mm -hmm. And he concentrated on that and he was, of course, an extraordinary communicator. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And as a person, you knew him obviously well as a person, just uh, how would you describe Yeah, him? as a person, he. Uh, he um, believed in loyalty up and loyalty down. I can't tell you how many times. See, I was the outsider in the Reagan White House. I was the Texan who had come mm -hmm. in, who'd run, I'd run two campaigns against Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. when he asked me to be his White House Chief of Staff. Now, how broad gauged is that? <laughs> that will never happen again mm -hmm. in American mm -hmm. uh, politics, in my view. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he was there for me when when some of the so-called true believers would attack me, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and he was well. His record speaks for itself. He was an extraordinarily effective uh, two-term president of the United States. And I really enjoyed your very poignant remarks at Nancy Reagan's funeral Thank you. recently and uh, you even quoting Shakespeare and um, but they were very uh, heartfelt and the two together Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan that was they were a beautiful a love story mm -hmm. that's correct and she was his she was his protector she was a, his guardian she was his strongest supporter and she was his best friend mm -hmm. Reagan didn't have a lot of really close friends. Uh, she was she was his best friend, and she was his personnel chief. Mm -hmm. She knew when somebody was paddling their own canoe, and she protected him. Mm -hmm. And she was very she had a, she had a great political antenna. Mm -hmm. President Bush, forty one. Uh, President Bush, as a leader and as a person, obviously you knew him so well, well. of course, there, I've known him, of course, uh, longer and better than any of the presidents I've worked for. And uh, uh, here's a man who, at the age of 18, uh, enlisted in the Navy as soon as World War II broke out, fought for his country. He was a decorated uh, pilot in, in the military. He succeeded in almost everything he ever attempted to do. He lost some elections, mm -hmm. <coughs> but he never gave up, and he kept going. And, uh, and, and not only was he a, a war hero, he was a successful businessman. 
He was uh, chairman of the Republican Party. He was, well, first he was county chairman here in Houston, Texas. That was his start in politics. Then he was a congressman. Then he was a, a, a ambassador to China. Then he was director of the CIA. And then he was vice president of the United States for two terms, eight years, and then he was president of the United States for a very successful one-term presidency. I'd say to people that he's the most successful uh, one-term president the, the country's ever had. I believe that strongly if you look at his record. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's too bad in, that he wasn't reelected. But he took over after eight years of Reagan. Uh, when he was running for re-election, we'd been in office for 12 years. Uh, the only constant in politics is change. Change is the only constant. It was hard for us to be seen as agents of change. And then we had Ross Perot out there taking 19 percent of the vote, mm -hmm. two-thirds of which we know mm -hmm. he took from us. So, uh, But George Bush was, was and is an incredibly wonderful human being, and, and he was a wonderful public servant and president of this country. And also for him, family has been so... Well, for him, family is very big. And you look at his family. You know, somebody asked him one time, uh, what are you most proud of? He said, I, I'm proud of the fact that our kids come home. Mm -hmm. And they do. And they're very close-knit, mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. tight-knit, mm -hmm. closely knit mm -hmm. family. Going over this history... Family, uh, faith, and yeah. friends. Yeah. Those are the three things. I gave a speech to the National Prayer Breakfast back in 1989 in which I uh, use those as the three most important uh, things in life. And I get more compliments about that speech and more requests for copies of that speech than any speech I ever <laughs> gave. And you describe that term, uh, President Bush, in, in those four years he was in the White House with German reunification. Um, a little bit back to your history of where you came from. You had a peaceful yeah. end of the Cold yes, War. So you so had German, German unification. Yes. You had the coalition, yes. unprecedented coalition yes. to kick Iraq yeah. out of Kuwait. Mm -hmm. You had the Madrid Peace Conference, first mm -hmm. time Israel and all of our Arab mm -hmm. neighbors had sat down. We got, we got rid of the wars in Central America. Mm -hmm. People forget that. Those were the holy grail of the left and the holy grail of the right for years. Yeah. And when we came into office, we negotiated with the Congress to take that, those issues out of the domestic political debate in the United States, and we got rid of them. Mm -hmm. We did NAFTA. South Africa ended apartheid during the time that George Bush was. There were so many accomplishments. For you personally, being a part of that German reunification and the opening up of Eastern Europe, based on the history we're talking yeah. about being a World War II generation person and um, your connections to Russia, that personal connection. Yeah, it was to fascinating. Canada, it, was it like, did you ever just pinch yourself that you were like, Absolutely. you were directly involved in, in what? I, I did indeed. Yeah. It, was hard, <laughs> it was hard to believe. Um, this is actually Masters Week. Masters, uh, the golf tournament, yeah. starting, uh, starting uh, I think, starts tomorrow. Um, we've talked about coalition building and and unifying. I, I think you're sort of the master of the of coalition building and u unifying. You did it uh, at Treasury. I think uh, people uh, often overlook your period as Treasury Secretary, mm -hmm. but you were doing things there with economic coordination and. Uh, yeah, multilateral uh, mm -hmm. uh, policy coordination, it's very important. We don't do it as much anymore. We should, but we don't. And then we did the Plaza Accord, and we did, we did the uh, Canadian-U.S. Uh, Free Trade Agreement, which mm -hmm. was the forerunner mm -hmm. of NAFTA. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. we hadn't done that, it wouldn't have been a NAFTA. Mm -hmm. So you've done we that. We fixed yeah. Social yeah. Security, but that was, 80, that was in 83, though. Yeah. And, and you were doing it as uh, tax to the reform, staff. 86, the yes. 86 Tax Reform Act, mm -hmm. and which, by the way, was real tax reform because it didn't swell. We didn't pump up the debt and deficit by a trillion and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. We did it revenue neutral. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. hard to do. We did it bipartisan. We did it with Democratic votes. And you were doing that as chief of staff as well, just building these coalitions, right, for the implementation that you're talking about. That's correct. Um, where do you think that talent comes from? Wh wh I think it's better to be lucky than good. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. I don't know. Uh, 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 who knows? You know, I, as I, I said earlier, I had wonderful parents. Uh, I was brought up with a, a commitment to a serious work ethic. I was always taught to, that, the, that it was really important to, if you take something on, to finish it mm -hmm. and to succeed with it. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we took on a lot of tough things. There was no assurance on, on almost any of those things you we've just mentioned that we were going to make them work. But I was, I was raised that way, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a part of almost your DNA, you were describing mm -hmm. President Reagan, just to Maybe. bring people together. And, Maybe. Um, do you, and it's important for a leader to have that attribute, of, to build, unify teams and coalition building. Um, the Diplomacy Center in Washington, D.C. is the first museum uh, in the nation dedicated to diplomacy and telling stories of diplomats. And obviously, you have been a very active supporter of the diplomacy. Center. I believe in it. I think it's uh, <clears throat> we got a lot of military museums and military uh, uh, monuments and things. We don't have much. In fact, we don't have any uh, on diplomacy mm -hmm. and the importance of diplomacy. Uh, diplomacy is very important uh, to the foreign policy and national interests of the United States, and so I just thought there ought to be something like that. And you were so reliant on the career of professional foreign service. You I was. Yeah. You know, when I first went in, they, uh, the, <laughs> the knock on me was that, that I was political. Well, yeah, well, yeah, I came up through the political track, and I think my experience, by the way, in politics I attribute a lot of my success to my, to what I learned running political campaigns mm -hmm. and being a politician. Mm -hmm. That's why my memoir about my years as Secretary of State is entitled The Politics of Diplomacy. And so when I first came in, I was not, I was not uh, warmly received by uh, by a lot, some in the press who were worried they were going to lose their sources, or by mm -hmm. some of the Foreign Service mm -hmm. people. But I ended up uh, utilizing mm -hmm. uh, everybody, uh, you know, all my assistant secretaries were, uh, were for the most part, save one, were career people. I, I named a uh, Foreign Service officer as my deputy, mm -hmm. first time a deputy mm -hmm. secretary of state mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. been Foreign Service officer. Uh, and so we had a really good team, some political people that I brought in, yes, and, but combined with the resources and assets mm -hmm. of the Foreign Service and the, and the uh, State Department. And just for the listeners, so they have a sense of how large the Foreign Service is, I think it's often misunderstood. It's about 15,500 people, that's it. It's that's very, it. very small. Yeah, it is. And do you feel, that it let, is let me digress for a minute and go, go back ahead. and say, Please. you know, if, as I said, when I first arrived, <clears throat> I was met with some reservations and trepidation because I was a politician. And uh, by the time I'd been there, maybe no more than three or four months, and it became apparent that not only was I utilizing the resources of the Foreign Service and, and the State Department itself, but that my relationship with President Bush was so tight mm -hmm. that we were going to run foreign policy from mm -hmm. the State Department. Mm -hmm. and, and the minute the, minute the uh, building and the Foreign Service realized that, mm -hmm. yes. th that's, all that's all they want is to be in the action. Okay. Yes. And, and, and because of my relationship, my seamless relationship with President Bush, the decisions on foreign policy were mostly for the large in large part made in the State Department. We were the formulators and implementers of the Bush administration's foreign policy. 
That's what the Foreign Service exists for. That's what they want. So they were very happy yes, with me. Yes, yes. Do you think that potentially, if you think of that capacity of roughly 15,500 people within the Foreign Service, and the Foreign Service is not, as you know, just State Department, it's USAID yeah, yeah, yeah. and even Commerce and Department of Agriculture, could it be larger? Could there be almost a political vision to, much along the lines of what we do with the U.S. military, expand the Foreign Service? Or I, don't really I don't really answer that. I found it to be sufficiently mm -hmm. <coughs> large and competent mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. sufficiently expert to meet, to meet the needs uh, of our foreign policy as I saw them when I was Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. And thank you for talking about, as Secretary of State, that relationship you had with President Bush, I think it was unique. It, it, it was unique. And yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. I, I can't, if I go over history, I can't see a Secretary of State who had such a close relationship. I don't relationship think you'll find government. one that had a closer relationship with his president. What I tell people is, I, I was the luckiest guy in the world to be Secretary of State when I was. The world was changing, fundamentally. What the world we had known all of our adult lives changed and changed completely. And here I was, Secretary of State, to a President of the United States with whom I had been a close friend for 35 or 40 years, mm -hmm. who was the godfather of my daughter, mm -hmm. and whose political campaigns, every one of which I had run. Mm -hmm. So nobody was gonna get between me and my president. And when I went out, in the world and spoke, mm -hmm. they knew I was speaking for the mm -hmm. President of the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, in Washington, D.C., everybody wants a piece of the foreign policy turf. Everybody. And I didn't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. I picked my own people. I didn't have mm -hmm. any orders sent to me from the White House personnel office. Here's somebody you need to hire this or that. Mm -hmm. Anybody I wanted to hire, they weren't going to check their b political bona fides because right. I had been right. chairman of the campaigns. Yes, yes, so yes. It was a unique experience. And we talked about Baker Botts and the history of the name, and I wanted to talk just a bit about the uh, uh, Rice University and the Baker Institute um, mm -hmm. and what you have done. That that does bear your name, the Baker Institute. Yeah, is Baker is James A. Yes. Baker, the Third yeah, Institute yeah, for Public yeah. Policy at Rice University, and it's really we've succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. We started it 25 years ago. We're going to celebrate our 25th anniversary this year. We now uh, enjoy an endowment of about 110 to 115 million dollars endowment. Mm. We uh, we endow. Uh, uh, about 24 or 25 Baker Institute scholars, people that we recruit, mm -hmm. come in from the world of action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've been out there and, mm -hmm. and doing things in the real world, mm -hmm. and they interface with people from the world of ideas, mm -hmm. the social sciences departments, and pe people at Rice Uni University. And, and, and uh, it's been really extraordinarily successful. I have a uh, founding director named uh, Edward Derigian, who yes. was my assistant secretary of state for the foreign Middies. service. Yeah, out mm -hmm. of foreign mm -hmm. career foreign service mm -hmm. officer. He and his wife Francoise uh, were foreign service couple for 33 years mm -hmm. before they uh, became mm -hmm. the directors mm -hmm. and, and his and wife of the director of the Baker Institute. They left the post as ambassador to Israel to take this job mm -hmm. with me, and I'm sure they had plenty of doubt about it in the first year or two when we didn't have two pennies to rub together <laughs> for the Institute, but now I think they know they made the right move, and they sure made the right move as far as we're concerned. They've done a remarkable job. It really is such a remarkable institution, and I encourage everyone to go to the Baker Institute website and even the Rice University website can watch events and it's a great resource and so 
really congratulations on what Thank the you. Baker Institute is doing. I'm actually a senior fellow at the University of St. Thomas here in, in Houston you? as well. And mm -hmm. Part of what I'm doing with them is researching this point on whether or not the Foreign Service capacity is where it needs to be yeah. mm -hmm. and whether or not it can be diversified as well. Um, I'd like to close with a couple of thoughts um, taken from a national prayer breakfast that you spoke at in 1990. 89. Uh, 89, okay. Yeah. All right, 89. So roughly 28, 29. I think it was 89. Uh, 90? <laughs> I don't remember. Maybe. You know me. Yeah. Um, what you said there, quote, is inner security and true, real fulfillment comes by faith. It doesn't come by wielding power in a town where power is king, end quote. Uh, and I feel that is just so wise. Mm -hmm. I feel it's so wise, and as you reflect back on your life and your experiences, it probably has even deeper meaning uh, to you. Can you explain that the, the thought, like what you what you meant by this, the inner security and the true, the real fulfillment uh, in, in life? Well, what I mean is that power is fleeting. And uh, I use, as, uh, in that speech, I used an example, <coughs> uh, an instant when I was, when I was driving through the uh, Northwest Gate of the White House one day, and I looked up and there walking down the street was someone who'd been a chief of staff Mm. before I yeah. was, and there he was with no, uh, no security, no retinue, no driver, no, just solitary individual walking down the street, as far as I knew, alone with his thoughts. And I thought to myself, you know, there, there one day go I. I mean, yeah. the only thing that I think is really lasting in, uh, in life, really, uh, it, it is what I said earlier, and that is faith, family, and friends. Those are the three things that are, that are uh, important, and that's what I was uh, emphasizing in that speech. Is it important for a leader to recognize that they have weaknesses, that they need to rely on other people to... Yes, and in that speech I make the point that there was a period when I was sec with chief of staff where I was under attack, and uh, I went to Washington with a very good reputation. Many people go up there and they get brutalized. And I mean, that, it's a nasty, ugly town, as you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the confirmation process or something else, and I was involved in, a, in an incident in, a, in 1983, I think it was, where my integrity was being challenged and, and, uh, and uh, where I realized maybe for the first time that I needed some help to deal with problems like that. That mm -hmm. it, it wasn't just up to me. Right. Uh, that, in, that, that uh, I was reasonably self-sufficient. I thought, well, at first I thought, well, you know, you can deal with everything. I needed, I needed uh, something else, and my wife uh, gave it to me, and she read some, she read some passages to me that gave me uh, inner strength and comfort mm -hmm. during that time, and it was a really quite a traumatic time because I was running the risk. Of, uh, it, someone was challenging my word publicly, and as it turned out, th there was an investigation. My word was, uh, the conclusion was that I was telling the truth, which mm -hmm. I knew I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, But it was a very traumatic time for me, and that's when I realized that you, sometimes you, in, uh, in life you have these difficulties, you can't get through them all by yourself, you need, you need some help, and that help comes from your faith, mm -hmm. your family, mm -hmm. and your friends. And you feel then it is important to be humble and charitable for leaders that either aspiring to leadership or currently in leadership, the attributes of charity and humility, those are very humility important. Humility is really important. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times leaders become overly arrogant and overbearing. Mm -hmm. They're gonna fail. Mm -hmm. Those kind of leaders are gonna mm -hmm. fail. 
Well, thank you for your personal thank example. You. And as I say, it's a real honor for me to thank be able to speak much. with you. Thank you very and much. I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you for your contributions. We appreciate you listening. Please go to ClydeBuiltNow.org for more information or visit us on our Facebook page at ClydeBuilt International. Thank you.